Ladies and gentlemen, Master Gunnery Sergeant Michael Ryan of the United States Marine Band. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, Senator Lautenberg, members of Congress, ladies and gentlemen, we come here today, Democrats and Republicans, Congress and President, Americans of goodwill from all points of view and all walks of life, to celebrate a true milestone for our nation. In a few moments, I will sign into law the first balanced budget in a generation, a balanced budget that honors our values, puts our fiscal house in order, expands vistas of opportunity for all our people, and fashions a new government to lead in a new era. Like every generation of Americans before us, we have been called upon to renew our nation and to restore its promise. For too long, huge, persistent, and growing budget deficits threatened to choke the opportunity that should be every American's birthright. For too long, it seemed as if America would not be ready for the new century, that we would be too divided, to wedded to old arrangements and ideas. It's hard to believe now, but it wasn't so very long ago that some people looked at our nation and saw a setting sun. When I became president, I determined that we must believe and make sure that America's best days were still ahead. After years in which the deficit drained our economy and dampened our spirit, in which our ability to lead the world was diminished by our inability to put our own house in order, after years in which too many people doubted whether our nation would ever come together again to address this problem, we set off on a new economic course. To cut the deficit, to create the conditions in which business could thrive, to open more foreign markets to our goods and services, to invest in our people so that all Americans would have the tools they need to make the most of their own lives. Today, our budget deficit has been cut by more than 80%. It is now among the smallest in the industrialized world as a percentage of our economy. Our businesses once again lead in world markets, now made more open, more free, more fair than ever before through our efforts. Our workers are clearly the most competitive on Earth, and we have recast our old government so that a new one can take shape that does give our people the tools to make the most of their God-given abilities. This year, we, Democrats and Republicans alike, 
were given the opportunity and the responsibility to finish the job of balancing the budget for the first time in almost 30 years, and to do it in a way that prepares Americans to enter the next century stronger than ever by large bipartisan majorities in both houses we have risen to that challenge. The balanced budget I signed into law today will continue our successful economic strategy. It reflects the most fundamental values that brought us together. It will spur growth and spread opportunity. Even after we pay for tax cuts penny by penny, there will still be $900 billion in savings, including half a trillion dollars in entitlement savings over the next 10 years. It opens the doors of college to a new generation with the largest investment in higher education since the GI Bill 50 years ago. It makes it possible for the 13th and 14th years of college to become as universal as high school is today. It strengthens our families with the largest expansion in health care for children since the Medicaid program 32 years ago. It modernizes Medicare and extends the life of the trust fund for a decade. It helps our communities to rebuild, to move a million more people from welfare to work, to bring the spark of private enterprise back to our most isolated inner city neighborhoods. It provides the largest tax relief to help families raise their children, save for the future, and pass on their home and a dream to the next generation. These tax cuts are the equivalent of a $1,000 raise in take-home pay for the average family with two children. For so many Americans, what goes on here in Washington often seems abstract and remote, unrelated to their daily concerns. Well, this balanced budget deals with the big issues of the deficit and long-term economic growth in ways that respond to the practical challenges ordinary American citizens face every single day. Because we have acted, millions of children all across this country will be able to get medicine and have their sight and hearing tested and see dentists and doctors for the first time. Millions of young Americans will be able to go on to college. Millions of Americans not so young will be able to go back to school to get the education and training they need to succeed in life. Millions of families will have more to spend on their own children's needs and upbringing. This budget is an investment in their future and in America's. Today, it should be clear to all of us, without regard to our party or our differences, that in common, we were able to transform this era of challenge into an era of unparalleled possibility for the American people. I hope we can tap this spirit of cooperation and use it to meet and master the many challenges that remain before us. I want to thank, in closing, the many people whose work made this day possible. I want to thank Speaker Gingrich and Senator Lott, Mr. Armey and the other members of the House and Senate leadership, especially Senator Domenici and Senator Kasich. And let me thank Chairman Archer and Chairman Roth and the other leaders of the, of the House and Senate committees. They were dedicated partners. They fought hard for their priorities. I want to thank Senator Daschle and Congressman Bonnier and Congressman Fazio and Congressman Hoyer and the other members of the House Democratic leadership who worked with us. I want to thank especially Congressman Spratt and Senator Lautenberg, Congressman Rangel and the other members of the House and Senate Democratic minority leaders in the committees for the work that they did. I thank all the members of the Congress who are here present and the many whom they represent who are already back home who could not be. All of them deserve our thanks, and I would like to ask the members of the Congress who are here today to stand and be recognized and appreciated by the crowd. I'd like to thank the members of our budget team, Erskine Bowles, Secretary Rubin, John Hilly, OMB Director Raines, Gene Sperling, Janet Yellen, Rahm Emanuel, Jack Lew, Larry Summers, Chris Jennings, and many others, especially those uh, who work in our legislative shop, 
too numerous to mention for the enormous work that they did on this agreement i would like to thank the first lady mrs gore the vice president for their concern for the health of our children for the mental health of the american people and the vice president especially who led the fight to protect our urban initiatives and our environmental program and the interests of legal immigrants in America. We owe to them a great deal. Again, I say to all, I thank you. I believe that together we have fulfilled the responsibility of our generation to guarantee opportunity to the next generation the responsibility of our generation to take America into a new century where there is opportunity for all who are responsible enough to work for it, where we have a chance to come together across all of our differences as a great American community, where we will be able to continue to lead the world toward peace and freedom and prosperity. That is worthy work, and you have all contributed to doing it. We can say with pride and certainty that those who saw the sun setting on America were wrong. The sun is rising on America again, and I thank you all. The Speaker of the House of Representatives. Thank you all very much. Let me start by picking up where the President ended, and that is saying thank you to an awful lot of people. This has been a long time coming. It has been a difficult process. But in that process, we have proven together that the American constitutional system works. That slowly, over time, we listen to the will of the American people, that we reach beyond parties, we reach beyond institutions, and we find ways to get things done. I want to start by thanking the President and Mrs. Clinton, the Vice President, and Mrs. Gore, because their willingness this year, coming off their victory, to reach out a hand and say, let's work together, was the key from which everything else grew. And the sincerity of their efforts over the last eight months has made an enormous difference in our capacity to make this system work. And I thank the four of you for your involvement. There were many, many people on the President's staff, just as there are many, many members of the Congressional staffs who are here today who put in extraordinarily long hours, who missed their families for weekends at a time, who worked seven days a week all through the spring and summer. But in particular, I want to join the President in thanking three people, Erskine Bowles, John Hilly, and Secretary Bob Rubin, because again of the commitment they made from the very beginning that this would be a successful process, and I thank the three of you for serving your country. I also want to thank the Budget Director, Franklin Raines, not just for the budget, but for his special effort working with Tom Davis and Eleanor Holmes Norton and others to do something special for the District of Columbia. No bill ever passed by the U.S. Congress provides more opportunity for the rebirth and the renewal of the District of Columbia than the bills that will be signed today. They represent a major bipartisan effort to get resources and reform to the people of D.C. and to make this truly the finest capital city in the world. And I thank you, Frank, for the work you did to make that possible. In the Congress, the truth is that almost everybody had a major role. Senator Lott, who uh, without whom nothing would have happened in the Senate. Uh, Senator Domenici, who had spent over 20 years of his career working to get to a balanced budget, and who really was the big brother, if you will, the senior partner with John Kasich, whose courage and energy and drive inspired all of this. And without John's work, 
we would never have gotten to a balanced budget on the House side. You know, Majority Leader Dick Armey, uh, Minority Leader Tom Daschle in the Senate, uh, Chairman Roth and Archer on taxes, Chairman Bliley, who helped so much on so many different topics, key members of the minority, uh, Congressman Spratt of, and, and, and Senator Lautenberg, who really carried so much on the budget committees, and Congressman Rangel and Senator Moynihan, who were so integral on the tax side. And they stood for member after member who truly wanted to get the job done, who wanted to put aside partisanship, who wanted to reach beyond past enmities, and who wanted to do the job. But all of us in Washington, if we're sincere about it, will admit that the ultimate driving force of this bill was the will of the American people. It is the American people who have said to all of us, we want to balance the budget for our children and grandchildren. It is the American people who said our tax burden is too high and we need lower taxes. And it is the American people who said Medicare is so important, you must put aside your differences to save it. And in that sense, all of us today stand here as servants of the American people. And it is they who deserve the ultimate tribute because it is their work in the economy that's producing the revenues to narrow the deficit. It was their political will that brought the two parties together. And we and our constitutional system serve them. Because of this, because of these two extraordinary bills the President will sign in just a moment, we will get to a balanced budget by 2002, a commitment we had made on January 4, 1995, and which we worked closely in a bipartisan way to make real. We will meet the moral integrity test in peacetime of not spending our children and grandchildren's money. And we will, as the markets come to realize we are sincere and bipartisan, see interest rates continue to come down and continue to improve economic growth. We'll see real tax cuts for the first time in 16 years. Families with children will get their $500. And through a long bipartisan tussle, that will affect every family below $110,000 income. If you're working and you have a tax liability, you're going to get a tax cut. And I commend the President for leading that effort. And we together have done it. No longer will there be a cliff as you leave welfare and have a sudden rise in your tax burden. If you have children, your country wants to encourage you to work and it wants to encourage you to take care of your children. The educational tax credits are going to help those children when they get ready to go to college or to vocational technical school. And then there will be incentives to save to improve their lives. If they buy a house, there will be no capital gains tax if they have to sell it. There will be incentives to create more jobs. Small business will be relieved of the burden of AMT and a big step towards simplification for small businesses. And families will face the prospect that if your parents or grandparents have saved all their lives, you won't be punished nearly as much by the government in taxes when you die. And that's a first step in the right direction on eliminating the tax when people die. On Medicare, we came together and we've saved the system for at least a decade. But equally important with the President's leadership, we working as a team have established a commission to come right back here in 1999 with an obligation to save the Medicare system for our children and grandchildren and to save it for the baby boom generation. And as you look up here, you'll notice we have a deep personal incentive to make sure we save it for the baby boom generation. And I pledge right here, working with the President, that we will work on a bipartisan basis, not just to appoint a good commission, but to enact in 1999 the right savings and the right steps to reform the system for the baby boomers and their children. Finally, <laughs> let me just close by echoing what the President said at the end, because he's so right. We have a chance over the next three and a half years to work together through our very complex constitutional process of a legislative branch and executive branch guarded by the judiciary, we have a chance to work together to accomplish a lot, to have a truly drug-free America, to have every child learning at their best rate, to help children be born or adopted into families that can truly nurture and raise them. We have a chance to continue this economic incentives and growth that has led over the last five or six years to such remarkable progress. And we have a chance to establish a firm understanding of the challenge America faces in the world, for we are the only country capable of providing leadership in the next generation in a calm, consistent, and coherent manner. And that can only come if there is a bipartisan consensus on how America must shoulder its obligations as the leading country in the world. Marianne and I came back today to be here to say that we pledge 
to work with the President and with our friends in the Congress on the Democratic side, that together we can make bipartisan progress at home and we can provide bipartisan leadership across the planet. And that is our duty for our generation and to our children. Thank you very much. Senator Frank Lautenberg. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Mrs. Clinton, Mrs. Gore, Mr. Speaker, and uh, all those who worked to make this agreement possible, uh, thank you on behalf of the American people and the United States Congress, Mr. President, for your leadership and your direction and for getting this balanced budget agreement into place. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, I also want to say thanks to you for your encouragement, for the many phone calls, uh, for the advice, counsel, um, direction uh, during this uh, during the, these negotiations. I, I counted on the Vice President, and uh, he was there for me, and I appreciate it. Today is a great day for America when historians write the closing chapter of the 20th century. They'll write about the critical leadership, Mr. President, you provided at just the right time for our nation's future. This budget lays out an agenda that will have America leading the way into the next century free of deficits, investing in our children, creating new jobs and opportunities, reassuring our elderly, encouraging middle-class families, and helping the poor to get a start on a new life with dignity and respect. Mr. President, I know uh, how a helping hand can turn a life around because of my own experience. I grew up in a poor working-class family. My widowed mother struggled just to survive. I had little chance for wider horizons. But then our government changed it all. And thanks to a visionary program called the GI Bill, I was given an opportunity to get my college education. And the experience changed my life forever. I will never forget the moment I walked onto the campus of Columbia University knowing that I was going to be able to go there when it was never, would have never been possible without the GI Bill. It's, that's how come I came to st uh, start a a business and eventually privileged to come to the United States Senate. And there are literally millions of young people who are today in exactly the same circumstance. They're just as smart as anybody else. They have just as much to offer our country, but they too need a helping hand. And we're about to give them that chance, and that's what this country is all about. Mr. President, the American people challenged us to work together for a better future. The call was simple but wise. They said, give us the building blocks so that with our own hands we can build a successful future, providing education for our kids, health care and opportunity for our families. And if you do that, our country will prosper and our democracy will grow stronger. And we'll continue to provide the leadership for the world in the next century. Under your leadership, we accepted that challenge and we have created crafted a mission that is truly historic and puts us on the right track for the future. This agreement is an example of what we can achieve when both parties work together. Mr. President, it's a privilege for me to have played a role in the development of this agreement, and it's truly a great honor to serve with the President of Uncommon Vision and Leadership. You provided that every step along the way. On behalf of our nation, let me simply say thank you. The Vice President of the United States. To the President and the First Lady, Tipper and I are very honored to take part in this ceremony today. To you, Mr. Speaker, and to 
Mrs. Gingrich, Mary Ann, please stand so we can acknowledge you. Thank you very much. To uh, Senator Lautenberg and Senator Roth, to the other distinguished members of Congress uh, who are here, most of whom have been mentioned and all of whom have played a, a key role, to the budget team who have uh, been singled out for special praise, appropriately so, and to the members of the Cabinet, and I would like to acknowledge the members of the Cabinet, each of whom, along with their teams, played a key role in bringing about this agreement. The Secretary of State, uh, Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, Bob Rubin, the Secretary of Interior, Bruce Babbitt, the Secretary of Agriculture, Dan Glickman, uh, the Secretary of uh, Labor, Herman, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Shalala, Secretary of Transportation, Slater, Secretary of Education, Riley, Administrator of the EPA, uh, Browner, uh, Ambassador to the UN, Bill Richardson, uh, and two who have been mentioned, the uh, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Frank Raines, and the Chief of Staff, Erskine Bowles. Would all of you please stand so we can acknowledge and thank you. The President mentioned uh, John Hilly and uh, Janet Yellen and others who are part of the uh, budget team. Uh, Bruce Reed, we could go down the, the row here and, and uh, single out the people who made a key difference. I would also like to acknowledge uh, some representatives here of America's uh, cities and counties. Uh, Mayor Mark Morial of uh, New Orleans is here. Governor Roy Schneider of the Virgin Islands is here. Mark Schwartz of Oklahoma City is here, President of the National League of Cities. C. Vernon Gray of, uh, of the National Association of Counties. And there may well be others that I do not know to mention. But we are happy that you are here and grateful to you for the constant communication that America's cities and counties and states uh, maintain during this whole process. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a few moments, with a few strokes of his many pens there on the, uh, the desk, <laughs> President Clinton will give our country our first balanced budget in 30 years. It is quite an achievement because it's not only in balance, it is a budget that protects our values and invests in our future and cuts taxes for tens of millions of middle class families. The full story of this budget takes uh, a lot more ink to complete than uh, are contained in, even in these pens. Because of this budget, families in America will get a $500 tax cut for every child they care for and raise. We insisted that the hardest pressed working families, those with the teachers and police officers, nurses and firefighters, get to share in that tax cut. Thanks to President Clinton and thanks to the Congress, they will. Because of this budget, we can say goodbye to last year's flawed immigration provisions. Legal immigrants, those who came to this country for the promise it provides, will now be treated with fairness and dignity, including the elderly and the disabled. Because of this budget, we'll do a lot more to protect the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we put on the dining room table. We'll also clean up 500 of the most dangerous toxic waste sites in America so that our children have a chance to grow up next to parks and not poison. Because of this budget, we will renew and revitalize America's cities, more than tripling the number of communities participating in the President's highly successful Empowerment Zone and Enterprise Community Program, and providing new tax breaks to clean up as many as 14,000 brownfields, those urban eyesores that have kept families and businesses away from the core of our cities for far too long. Because of this budget, we will have important new incentives to move people from welfare to work, to make responsibility a way of life all across America. And of course, uh, 
the historic provisions providing health care for children, including mental health care, for the first time in many cases, are included in this budget. The truly historic new initiatives in education have been mentioned and commented upon, but I dare say that the historians looking back on this day will probably focus more on the breakthroughs in education contained in this budget than anything else. And of course, there are a great many people who made this balanced budget possible, and we thank them all, and the country thanks them all. And I think it's worth pausing just for a moment to consider that we could have had protracted gridlock. We could have had a long, bitter struggle that drained people in both parties, that drained away confidence in self-government, uh, and might have been enjoyable to some who love the, the combat, but would not have been good for this country. You know, I think it was Will Rogers who once wrote that we Americans generally do the right thing after first exhausting every other available alternative. <laughs> I know from the standpoint of the White House and from the standpoint of the country, there's one person who was the key in leading our country away from that gridlock, away from that partisan combat, and toward a chance to really work together. President Clinton has been that driving force, not just for the past few months, but for the past four and a half years. It was, after all, this president who cut the deficit by more than 80 percent to place a balanced budget within reach to make it possible for us to come together around an achievable task. It was President Clinton whose tough choices lowered interest rates and turned this economy around, giving us the highest economic growth in a decade, the lowest unemployment in 24 years, more small businesses, more families buying their own homes than ever before. And it was President Clinton who knew that if tough, disciplined fiscal policy and a stronger economy worked hand in hand, we could put an end to those deficits while still investing more in our future. I know very well the naysayers in both parties will minimize the importance of today's signing. They'll say it was easy, but they shouldn't. And we ought to remember that bipartisanship can do great things for this country if we respect our disagreements, if we hold to our principles, if we make an honest, good faith effort to understand what the other side is saying, to take the best offered by each side and try to do what's right for our country, we can make tremendous progress. We've made that kind of progress in the last four and a half years, and it wasn't easy. Those who say it was, don't understand because it was a tough fight all along the way. Mr. President, you just made it look easy. Thanks to you, we have shown the American people that we do have what it takes in our representative democracy to work together across party lines to achieve great things for the American people. This isn't the end of that effort. It is really just the beginning. And we ought to go forward from this moment with new confidence, because we know that no challenge is too great for us to master. And now I am proud to introduce to the signing table the person who will give America a balanced budget with the force of law, President William Jefferson Clinton.